Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm here from Site Gallery, but also I'm on the uh, Docfest board, so I'm doubly pleased to be here with Jeremy. Um, I'm assuming you all know who Jeremy is, but to give you an introduction, Jeremy is a Turner Prize winning artist working in video, conceptual art, installation, and he's really known for his political and social work and his collaborations. And with that in mind, I really wanted to start with a piece of your work that would be familiar to many people in Sheffield, uh, Battle of Orgreave, which you would probably have seen in Hope is Strong. Uh, that was at Millennium Galleries last year. Um, Jeremy, do you want to talk around where, the, where, the, where it came from? I, well, yes. I mean, it was a reenactment of a, of a battle that happened about five miles from here during the miners' strike, mm -hmm. a very sort of notorious confrontation. And I had the idea to do it in the, this is a, uh, this is a, a photograph from the day in 1984. And it was, uh, I, I, it was something that stuck in my mind as a young person, had, having experienced the strike on television, mm. as most people did. And I wanted to remake this battle as a kind of forensic investigation into what had happened that day and almost kind of summoning up a, a kind of phantom of the strike mm. in the original place. Um, so this is a still from the film. And basically Channel 4 made it happen because they paid for the production of a TV programme and that paid for the reenactment. Right, right. And that's when and we, had, they had, we had, I mean, I might as well talk about money and all that, as seeing as this kind of audience. That's when they had half a million pounds right. to give us to make a film. Incredible. Which now I realise is a huge amount of money. It's a lot. A uh, massive yeah. amount. <laughs> <laughs> Having and made films for like... <laughs> 20,000 yeah, pounds since, I realised how lucky we were. And most of that money went on paying the people who took part. So I wanted to talk about that. So you, it's a reenactment. So there were reenactment professionals within the film, but also... Yes, there were people like this. Mm. And then there were people who were former miners and their families and local men. And it was mainly men. And so you had this mix of reenactors and former miners. And, and how did that work? How I mean, how did they well, it was work great. with each other? Well, it was great because there's a huge tension because the reenactors, on the whole, are very conservative people. Mm. And you know, you, you just have to look at what newspapers people were reading when we were on right. doing that to realise what their beliefs were. And they all came up against you know the sort of the living history of the strike in the shape of these men who were, had very different views of the world. And, and the reenactors actually, the night before the reenactment, and we didn't film it for the documentary, there was a meeting between the head of the reenactment societies and the production. I wasn't there. And they said, we're not going to do it tomorrow because we think they're going to start a real riot right. and you have to mix up the police and the reenactors because we think that actually the miners are going to start a, a real riot and start some kind wow. of revolutionary moment. And they really believe that. Yeah. So it was quite interesting. So there's a real tension on the day. Mm. So yes, that was like working with people. And how did you, with, the, with the, the real people within that work, how did you work on gaining their trust? And how did they, yeah, how, how was that process? Well, the process was long. I don't know mm. what it is like if you're making a documentary necessarily, but. Um, it was about a two-year process, and you'd start by coming up to this area and other areas around here and just telling people what you wanted to do in small groups, and then the groups got bigger and bigger, and word got around. This is almost pre-email, I should say. This is, this is 2000, 2001, and most of the men I was working with didn't have email, and neither did I at that point either. So it was for phone calls and just meeting in pubs and chatting, mm. and then word gets out, and you have big meetings like this with former miners and they'll sort of challenge you and talk to you and then but they kind of got it very quickly the mm. idea conceptually they understood what I was trying to do whereas the reenactors didn't get it so much but they had someone else dealing with them yeah. who they trusted so it was a kind of interesting relationship mm. they were told it was a non-political reenactment right. which is kind of ridiculous yeah. in a way right. they all <laughs> But if they wanted to be thought, if, if the head of the reenactment <laughs> societies wanted to believe that and yeah. tell them that, that's fine. Yeah. I mean, it was a hugely political, totally biased reenactment yeah, in some absolutely. respects, and that's what I wanted to do mm. in a way. Uh, actually, it wasn't that biased in the end, I think. But mm. um, it wasn't accurate, it wasn't massively accurate. But it was just the fact that we did it, I think, was important. Mm. You can't reenact a riot accurately, it's impossible. Mm. It's like reenacting chaos, you can't do it, especially live. It was shot live, um, and Mike Figgis came in very late in the day and shot right. it for us. Right. So yes, that, that's, um, that's a major thing, but very local to here. So I spent a lot of time in Sheffield. Yeah, great, yeah. great. 
Great. And I know that you will have loads of questions for Jeremy about this. So uh, we will have questions in around 20 There's minutes. There's lots of pictures so. of men in this <laughs> talk, which I, you sure will ask me about. This yeah, is another one. This, let's talk about brass band. This is the brass band. Again, this is before the uh, all grieve. Uh, and this really was the way that I became liberated from being a sort of artist that made objects and things and mm. sculptures. Not that I really did that anyway by just someone saying yes on a phone to doing something. Mm. And as the manager of this band said, yes, we will we'll play Acid House music once and we'll see how it goes as a project. And he just took a risk. Mm. And, and it, it made me realize actually the public on the whole are really up for doing things. And the art world often is quite afraid of the public. Yeah, yeah. why do you think that is? I don't know, because they're, so they're used to working with objects of high value oh. and, and uh, but don't answer back uh, often. And, uh, yeah. and, and uh, they can just put somewhere in a, in a sort of semi-sterile environment in yeah. a gallery and look nice. Where, but when the public come in and are making the work or are the work, it was a real shift in their understanding of art for a lot of curators, mm. I think. But this is 20 years ago. The world has changed massively since then. And galleries and the Tate understand audiences better and understand the idea of what audiences want from art. But when I was doing things like this, uh, this was in 97, uh, it was a diff it was it was quite different it was mm. um people weren't quite used to this sort of way of working mm, mm. before you move on yes. i would like to talk a bit, a bit about music actually because yes. tonight is the you're showing your film oh, tonight yes. at 10 10 o'clock everybody in the place well, this is 9 45 9 45 for 10. okay uh, okay to be clear i'm going to show a still of it if i can find it i might as well get this up let me just okay. go through i'm showing a film tonight that i made last year with freeze it's about music. It's about. It's really, in a way, it has a lot about the minor strike in it. It's about the eight, how you looked at a point in history in Britain through music mm -hmm. and how music and culture inform history and how history informs music. And it's done through a talk. I, basically, I'm giving a talk to a group of young people in London about the 80s as I see them. It's not very nostalgic, I have to say, I don't think, mm. but it's about... How, what it was like for me growing up at that age. And I just get the reaction when I show them footage of raves and talk about the politics of the time mm. and to see what they make of it. And uh, it's, it's an hour long. I'm going to introduce the film. But I thought I'd show the trailer, which is, I don't know, what, it's, the, I don't know it's one or two, I can't remember. <laughs> it's not as exciting as that for now. <laughs> It looks absolutely fantastic. Mm -hmm. It looks fantastic. That boy is me. He was just, yeah, yeah. for the whole thing. Well, at one it. point, I give, well, give them, we look at some of the equipment that made the music in the 80s that made Acid House music, yeah. and we just like, fiddle around on it, basically. Mm -hmm. So that's that point. But um, it was really to get a, I just didn't want to make a film that's like people just sitting in a room going on about how amazing it was and that, you know, when they were making, going right. to parties and off their heads and stuff. I wanted to make something that was about now and about yeah. these young people's look at them looking at history mm. from 25 years ago and what they make of it mm. and also about them and what what their lives are going to be like for the next five years mm. how, how how things are going to pan out for them I was, I was, they were always in my mind when i was making it Absolutely. so um yeah that's that's tonight that's the plug really that, that was my little plug yeah but like i said it's not it's not as exciting as that trailer for one hour. You can't make a film as a sort of like, <laughs> that gets you. I mean, you could. Orgasmic sort of like. Yeah, uh, you could. Yeah. Um, just one more last thing on music. I yes. really loved a project you did with steel bands. Yes. Yeah. I mean, with uh, they were doing covers of Cover like versions. Buzzcocks. Uh, yes, the Buzzcocks. That was uh, Ever Fallen in Love. That was here. But mm. I'd work with a steel band in... Uh, uh, London that did David Bowie, Man Who Sold the World, mm. and Voodoo Ray by um, a guy called Gerald. Because I think the thing about, I mean, I love steel bands anyway, but I think cover versions tell a story about how society changes mm. and how you can change and how culture changes. So they show about human uh, ideas about change and resilience and interpretation. So they're very, very, they tell, they have within very strong narratives, mm. I think. So I love cover versions. Um, so, and I love steel bands as well. The history of them in Britain is very, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a kind of sort of political history as well. So it, it's, music is a very good way of telling stories. Absolutely. And I think, so that in a way, that's what I'm trying to do with the film, the trailer you just saw. It's trying to tell a story through the music and through the eyes of, sort of musicians and young people. Absolutely. Um, 
Let's talk about this piece of work. This piece of work, yes. I mean, we're, we're, we're sort of talking today about how you work with the public, aren't we? We are, yeah. Um, and process and, this, and people and place. Yes, well, this was a sort of very complicated, potentially very dangerous piece of work. Not that it looks very dangerous there. It's a, it was taking a car that had been destroyed in Baghdad around America in 2009, which actually was a very good time to do that. Obama had just been made president, mm. and the country was actually quite calm. I don't think you could do this now. Um, and I went with a former soldier, like I said, and an Iraqi civilian, who's the guy with the, with the long hair sitting on the trailer. And they were nervous about doing it, mm. and they'd been in literally death, death-defying situa- you know, life of their situations. And we didn't know what to expect from the American public. So every day was a, a, a kind of a, a journey into some kind of unknown in terms of who was going to come and talk to you about this kind of disgusting object, really. And um, that's us hanging around in Arizona, just parking up and talking to the public as they wander around. And, and how far it. did you travel across America? Well, we, did, we, where did you go? We went from New York to L.A., so we did a road trip. But we went to, uh, through the southern states. We went oh. through right-wing areas on purpose. Mm. Uh, so through Texas, Mississippi, um, Alabama, all those places, which again I think now would be very difficult to do, and uh, just talk to Americans really, mm. and it was quite, it was incredibly intense, but uh, to do that because you don't really know who you're talking to right, when you exactly. walk up to someone, give them a flyer, you have no idea who they are. And so what was the um, the most intense reaction you had to the work as you were travelling through America well, with this? Well, there's a couple. We're going to show one, actually. But there's one here. This woman in white you see standing up, she used to work in the green zone, and we interviewed her. We, we documented it, but very poorly, which I think was important to do it quite... Not poorly, but sort of in a very low-key way. Because mm. often with a lot of art and performance and so on, is the documentation Absolutely. seems to be much more important than actually the experience mm. for the public. So we weren't very good with documentation in, in the way that you, we might, you might be now. Or, but that woman in white, for example, she'd, been, she'd worked in the green zone in, by chance. We didn't know she, was, she didn't know we were going to be there that day. So many people work for the army in America, and especially in universities, because people get their grants. So you get art students who ended up on wow. submarines loading mis- missiles into, wow. you know. Wow. It's kind of crazy. But, she, but she'd, so she'd worked in the green zone and she'd been the person who'd booked uh, basketball stars, cheerleaders, rappers to go and entertain the troops and had nights with pedicures and manicures for the troops where women would do pedicures and manicures on men, male mm. troops. Mm. And she told us stories about the Green Zone, which, you know, which is, you know, is like a city, basically, within Baghdad and about sort of what she said were prostitution rings going on there with wow. the Filipino women who were earning money as prostitutes, as well as being cleaners and sh- and all these things, it was un- you know we can't corroborate that necessarily. And the soldier that was with us was so angry when she was saying that because he said that, that would never happen. But I kind of believe it would happen actually. So that was quite intense. And then, well, I'm going to show a clip now if that's if that's all right. It's it's about three minutes. And this was something that you know this is for me. This was like almost not the ideal interaction, but it's an interaction with someone who talks about his whole life and how it's been affected by the war in Iraq and by the politics of America. Mm-hmm. And he talks about music and he talks about all these different things. It's kind of amazing. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I showed that in America recently, that clip, and it was just like silence. Silence, and yeah. They were like horrified, you know. The students, but mm. yeah, he, in a way, he was exceptional in that he was telling us that. But there's lots of other stories we got. But as you can see, the kind of quality of the recording wasn't quite what it. It's, it's a windy fine. day. <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. I think there's a really interesting point you make about the documentation of social work. Well, it can scare people off. I mm. think tripods scare people off, and uh, yeah, being heavy it changes. It changes the interaction with the participant. I suppose. Yes, I think so, and Makes I think. You... Um, we wanted to be as neutral as possible mm. with that image, and we're, even with that, you know, that image, with that phrase. I mean, we're just giving, it's like a factual, it's a fact. Mm. Uh, but we wanted to try and be inclusive. I know it's a word that's used a lot, and not scare people off from mm. either side. So that's, that's basically what, what we were attempting to do. Absolutely. Because we didn't want to get beaten up and shot did, at. Did you have security with you? No, no. But the, the Iraqi guy, Isam, was mm. the uh, Iraqi... Uh, judo 
cham national champion. Oh, so that counts as security. Yeah, and he was about mm -hmm. six foot four. Yeah. And then we had a soldier there who, the soldier had worked on PSYOPs yeah. in Iraq. Okay. So he, he kind of knew how to talk to people yeah. and sort of diffuse tension. Absolutely. But still, it could have been, could have gone really badly. Mm. We weirdly, the people that were most angry with us were anti-war people because they said we were too neutral and we should have been anti-war about the work, but it was never about that. It was trying to be like a museum exhibit, taking a mu museum exhibit yeah. on the road and not trying to give too much of a, an opinion. Because in a way, you don't really need an opinion. You, it's kind of clear what's happened. Mm. And, um, you know, um, so, but I, also, I should say, um, there's a big controversy this year at Venice because there's a boat on display. There is. Uh, which the, you the probably saw. Yes, I did, yes. In which maybe up to 1,000 people died. It's not even clear how many people mm. died. And... No one died in that car. It was a car that was parked and was blown up in a huge bomb attack on a market. Mm. So that's important. And it, obviously the car was not, the bomb was not in the car because it wouldn't exist mm. if it was. So that's an important point to make. But in a way the car, the, the car like that is effectively uh, uh, stands in for a body. And it was, I wanted it to be on the fourth plinth, a car from Iraq on the fourth plinth. Mm. And it didn't get, it was shortlisted, but it never made it. So I took, it, I took this car across America. Um, incredible work so and yeah this is a piece you've did for the centenary yes this is the centenary of a lot of kind of conflicts and sort of uh, again a lot of men in this talk I have to say and this is the centenary of the first day of the Battle of the Somme where I was asked to do a what what do you do I was asked what what would what we're going to do about the Somme basically that was the question I thought well, why don't we do this kind of living memorial mm. to the dead, effectively. So all around the UK, including Sheffield, people appeared and, and disappeared as soldiers and hung around places and watched the public and just mm. intervened in contemporary British life, as you can see there, yeah. and just stood around and sort of blocked the way, effectively, and, <laughs> and, didn't, and, and didn't speak. And again, how did, you, how did you recruit? What was the process to finding well, it, all these people? It was through theatre groups. Right. We worked with the National Theatre, you have to work with someone who, who has established networks when you do mm. something like this. There's no way we could have done this from scratch. And I wanted to work with the National Theatre. I wanted yeah. to kind of implicate the National Theatre and these national bodies and just mm. be national, but mm. also share the blame, basically, if it went wrong, effectively. <laughs> so it was, a, it was a way of doing that. So I got them on board. And it's great because all these young guys uh, would then say they'd done something with the National yeah. Theatre. I thought it was actually a really good thing to do. We did try and uh, have women dressed as male soldiers do this, but it didn't work, and, and no one, and it, unfortunately, it just wouldn't, it didn't look right, and it changed the whole meaning of the work in a way, not necessarily the best way. But um, this was, this is, I don't even know where this is, could be anywhere in Britain, couldn't it really? Uh, I think it might be London. But I wanted them to be seen in places that would not have existed in 1916. Mm. I thought that was important. Um, to be there. And it was a huge budget, and it was for one day, and there was no pre publicity. Oh, it was for one day? Yeah, and it was And what's bit... the documentation like for this? Well, we made a film actually with the BBC because it was filmed all over Britain by local news and by the public, mm. and we made a film about that, and it was really. It was shown some months later. Um, so I actually was quite happy with it. It starts with footage of, Memo of, of Remembrance Sunday at the Cenotaph, the last like. 30 years with all the different prime ministers, okay. you know, pre-Thatcher actually going up to current day. Mm -hmm. Just so, and it shows you that the, 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 the Remembrance Sunday uh, commemoration is actually is the same every year. It's literally, you could like intercut it and it would be the same thing. It was quite interesting. But anyway, uh, it was just about that. But also it was a week after the Brexit vote um, in 2016, and I think the public I mean, we thought it was bad then, you know, and <laughs> I think the public was just sick of politi yeah. politicians because yeah. there was a conservative, I mean, it's quite weird, there's a conservative party mm. uh, leadership campaign had just started and I think people were like really upset by what had happened mm. and what's happening. Absolutely. So that gave it an extra edge, I think. And that's right, and at that time, what, was it like working with those young people? Did you manage to have any conversation about yes. them, about Brexit and? Well, we did a lot of training and we went all, I went all around Britain, met every, more or less everyone that was taking part, gave them a talk, 
and it had to be a secret, and it was all that, you know. Do people keep, do they actually keep the secrets? Some, did, most did, a few didn't. <laughs> and how did you find out that they did I don't didn't? know, but they, we had someone who was finding out through Facebook posts <laughs> what people were Facebook. doing, and we, and we were like, yeah. Mm. They were being sort of told not to do it. They, so yes, we did. On the whole, they did, because I think they were told, and most of them were young actors or aspiring actors, and they were told, if you don't, if people know about it, it's not going to be as good for you. It's mm. actually not going to be very interesting mm. for you. So it's in your interest to be a surprise to the public and, or a shock. So we did a lot of exercises around this, about maybe sort of team building ones, I suspect. Mm. It's interesting to be in that world. I've never really been in the theatre world. Mm. I really liked it. It's a very, it's a very kind of can-do world. Yeah. And it's about groups doing things, whereas the art world is usually about individuals. Sure, absolutely. Who, you know, who are all vaguely depressed and sort of angry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so, very cheerful. So it's nice being... You are, yes. <laughs> but it's nice being around people who are really positive and yeah. like people and want to be like, hey, come Absolutely. on, let's all do this. Come and on, everyone. You know, you don't go in the art world. What's so great about your work is that you really, truly do bring these groups of people back together or together. And it's yes. like redefining communities. And well, I suppose so. And I, I mean, a lot of the recruitment was done blind, as it were, because people didn't know what they were signing up for sure. when, when it came to it. And then... It was quite, you know, they were quite mixed groups in a lot of ways. So it was, it was a really um, great thing to do, just travelling around Britain as well. And I wanted it as a piece to really sort of infect the country, mm. just to go everywhere like a mm. virus, really. And it became viral because of social media, and I knew that would happen. So it was a, I was very happy with it. Um, but there's nothing really, there's no legacy in the sense that there's no art that was made from mm. it. There's a, but that's it's, okay. No, it was yeah, great. Yeah. It was great. There's enough objects. And all the, all the costumes, were, the, the main cost of it was to make the costumes. We made nearly 2,000 very accurate First World War costumes in Poland. Oh, wow. And, uh, and so what's happened to those costumes? I mean, that's documentation. We, we, were re we were leased them from the company that made them. I mean, they did very well out of us. But, <laughs> and... Um, <laughs> They now have 2,000 World War I costumes, but I don't know what yeah. they're going to do with them. But uh, that was, a, that was a, a, a large part of the cost. Mm. Mm. I'm not quite sure what I've got next. Should we just keep going on? Yeah, I'd right? like to talk about the next project, the, the, the work that you were doing in prisons. Yes, well, this is the work that I showed in Venice, mm. but was made in prisons around Britain by former soldiers who'd gone to prison. There's a lot of former soldiers in prison, uh, prisons around Britain. And I did a, a, a piece of work where I went into a number of prisons around Britain mm -hmm. and got the former soldiers and some other inmates to draw mm -hmm. portraits of people who, who were involved in the war in Iraq in some way, and also for the soldiers to, to draw their experiences in prison, uh, in, in the army. So on the left, you see a portrait of John Scarlett, who I think was head of MI6 at the time, and you have Rupert Murdoch, which is second from the right. I mean, you can sort of tell it from this screen. You can't really tell really what's going on in that picture. There's a, there's a, a drawing, which is between, which is, I'll point to it, that drawing. You can't tell what it is, but it, it's actually a drawing made by a prisoner of an experience the day before he went out to Afghanistan in Wellington Barracks in London. Mm -hmm. There's a huge party and loads of the prisoner, uh, prisoners, sorry, loads of the soldiers were smoking crack cocaine and they were like out their heads they're saying they're all taking loads of drugs mm -hmm. so they probably thought they'd never come back so it's a drawing of it's an amazing drawing of two guys smoking crack with like a big white cloud and behind them is a union jack i mean it's an incredible sort of image and then other ones that's one the sniper sights uh, through view for a sniper sight and so on and it was just so it's a, a sort of a portrait gallery with very regular drawings in, in in a way it's very sort of rudimentary drawings a lot of them mm. but um that was uh yes that was 2013 so that was working in prisons for, for you know you'd go in for two or three days at a time yeah and, and how many prisons did you work with was it just the one i'm trying to think now i mean in scotland i worked with five guys quite intensively for three days and then there's bigger groups of, of men, it was maybe, 20, you know, it could be up to 20 in a room. And you give a talk. Giving a talk in a prison is a really good, it's a really good place to give a talk, actually, because mm. there's absolutely no space for any bullshit yeah. at all, because the men in prison, are, they're, they're so attuned to people lying and, to, and to, to psychological weakness that they, they are just looking for, for, for that, basically. Mm. 
So you, it's, you have to be totally sort of upfront about what you're doing, which is, you know, it's actually very good to do that. So, yeah, that was, that was some years ago now, but I've sort of been in other prisons and doing mm. things. And do you, this is a bit of a loaded question, no, because we had a lovely conversation with uh, Liz yes. earlier about the impact this work has on your participants. Well, it's, you hear? I suppose you don't know what the impact is afterwards because you don't often go back. Mm. I mean, strangely, at Everthorpe Prison, uh, before we took the drawings out, they had to be looked at by one of the prison warders. You might not be aware of this. And one of the prison warders, he... he, he um, what's the word when you sort of destroy a piece of paper? What's it when you put it in the machine? Oh, shred? Shredded it, sorry. I'm just, I've, it's been late nights. So. <laughs> he shredded a piece of work in front of one of oh. my colleagues. Just, I think just to show he had the power to do it. Mm. It was probably a picture of Tony Blair or something, but he didn't like the look of it. It looked very political. Yeah, so... Um, but you don't really know. You keep... You, you don't really know what the impact is afterwards. But actually, the impact on yourself is quite mm. high, so you suspect it might be for them as well, but you just, for the men, but you don't really know. But I... Um, Liz was actually at the prison when, uh, when I was there, not as a... Inmate, <laughs> I hated to her. I was head teacher at the time. Yeah, she was yeah. teaching yeah. in this big art, big art class, big art class, and with no windows in the, as I remember, no windows in the room. Mm. Then, but it was, it was good. I enjoyed it. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think it is working. Hello. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, Jeremy came into Everthorpe Prison, which is in East Yorkshire. Yeah, humble. Um, yeah, and um, works with us. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, Yes, Jeremy came into Everthorpe Prison, which was in East Yorkshire. Uh, at the time, I was head teacher there um, and worked with our... Well, we put, it was a group of men that had all been in the army, um, particularly in the Gulf. Um, and I think it was, it was probably over four or five weeks, wasn't it, that you were there with us? Well, I came back. He came back, yeah. And they worked in between on various projects. Uh, but it really did... It, 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 it changed their lives. They were recognised. Their emotions were recognised through his work, and it was an incredibly positive experience. But he was also very respectful of them, which is what I really you have appreciated. To be. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah, you do. But you wear, yeah. you wear as well. No, well, I, you know. Yeah, he did it. We were doing it for the right reasons. Yeah, which, yeah. Thank Again, you for it's that. like talking to the. I mean, this sounds weird. Like when you meet a group of miners, you're telling them about their lives. What they, yeah. you know, you can't. You just have to be honest, but straightforward about stuff, and, and yeah. exactly explain why you're doing something. Absolutely. Thank so. you, Liz. I'd, I'd like to open it out to conversations because we only have around ten minutes to questions. I think conversations. So if you've got questions, um, who, person with the mic. There's a lady here, and then we'll come to you. Hmm? Yeah. I've got 15 minutes. Hi. Um, Hello. Thanks very much. I'd just like to talk a little bit about the impact of your work, um, right. particularly the oh, first, I can see you. Can you see yeah. First World War, um, a week post Brexit vote. Um, I was working in Manchester city centre and I didn't know anything about this. Mm. And I left an office building and walked round the corner into spinning fields. And there was this incredible group of First World War soldiers. Mm. Absolutely amazing. It was an extraordinary moment, and I've never forgotten it. And it was, for me, it was one of the most profound experiences about, about remembering the First World War, because you went up to them. I went up to him, and I said, hello. And he just stared at me, didn't speak to me, looked at me. And then I moved on to the next group, and then the next group. And he gave me his card, which just said private... Jack Horsfall or something on a little name card and I carried that card around with me for about the next three years because mm. for me 
It was the most amazing combination of performance art, of history, of reality, of all the things that we documentary makers want to do, just encapsulated in one moment, and it happened completely by accident. I had no idea it was gonna, gonna be there. I just walked into Spinning Fields, and there it was. So I would like to say thank you very much, oh, because it's actually amazing. Pleasure. These two last people have spoken are not plants, by the way. But it just seems, <laughs> it just seems like they are. I'm just, I'm just, uh, but yes, I'm glad. I mean, the idea, the element of surprise is so important as well. I think everything is so heavily trailed now that I think it's good to have something that you're not expecting. Thank you. Hi there. Hello. I, uh, I saw the stuff at the beginning about the the, the 80s, and I was I was really sort of gripped by that because it was a. From what, I mean, even what I remember, it was a very hard, cynical town to live through, yet it was this massive cultural explosion with a huge legacy. And, uh, and on an autobiographical note, my father in 1984 was a striking miner and found himself at the uh, Battle of Orgreave getting off a bus and not knowing quite what to expect. And he tells this sort of interesting story of running alongside a fence and uh, people being distracted by something that happened there. Well, what's happened? And there was uh, the Arthur Scargard had just fallen off hit. his fence. Oh, yeah. And there he was sort of like holding this thing to his face. And now not that many people sort of saw that, but then a lot of other people sort of came running by and kind of made a story out of that. So this thing of this portrayal of what happened in that one small isolated thing was very different to what my dad actually saw. And I'm just wondering, like, with your, with your battle, uh, which I'm very interested to see, was the, this sort of big, like, uh, sort of, uh, conflict of, like, what happened here, what happened there? Did you, did you experience any conflict in sort of staging, planning that at all? Uh, the pl we, I mean, it was, it was basically a film set. That's how we portrayed it to the council and, and the police and a lot of other people. Because I think you say you're making a film, people kind of relax a bit. So they saw it as a, a film set. The council weren't particularly happy about it. It was a Lib Dem council at the time. The police weren't particularly happy about it. But there's nothing they could really, they couldn't really stop us from closing a road for a couple of hours, which is basically what it took. Um, I suppose they just didn't like the idea of like 800 people wearing police uniform wandering around the streets who were not clearly not police. So, um, but the real tension was really just between, like I said, between the reenactors, and that comes out in the film. It's very real, and and the miners understand it, and they sort of wind up the reenactors, and it's actually quite funny uh, when you see that. Um, but yeah, there's someone. Oh, okay. this lady, sorry. I'll pass it over. Um, you've made a few comments about the lack of women in yes. your work. You, so my two questions are, um, you've, you seem a bit apologetic, are you, and why? And also, is there work in the offing, or work that wasn't covered today? Uh, oh, hold on, there's two questions there. Um, why? Well, because it's something that comes up, and I feel I need to get the criticism in first. And... Uh, well, it's, it's funny, isn't it? Because I suppose what a, lot, a lot of those big reenactments are about conflict, clearly. And you know, it's clear that a lot of most conflict is done by men, to men, on the whole, in terms of like warfare and so on. Having said that, that I didn't think I was going to make another large scale performance piece like All Grieve in terms of the First World War piece. I never expected to do that at all. I never, I, so that was a surprise. But. Um, yeah, I suppose, I suppose some of it's about the nature of masculinity and the, the, the power and the destructive power of it. But, um, yeah, I, I actually don't like conflict and confrontational situations, but then I kind of make a point of coming back to it and making art that is, is definitely about that. Um, I just want to show some images. Can I just show very quickly images of what I'm working on at the moment? Or well, one of the things. It's, I've been spending a lot of time in Parliament Square filming the, the right and the far right, as you would call it. And some of these are some of the images from the Brexit day on March 29th this year, which is meant to be, you know, the day where we left the EU, but we didn't. And I've just been trying to make sense of what I saw and what I, what I filmed. I'm making a film about this process in central London, and this kind of theater, basically, in central London that has happened around Parliament. 
and it was going to be based around an interview with someone, but that person pulled out of the interview last week, so I just have all this footage, and I don't really know what to do with it. So this is a guy with all these tattoos, which I've sort of been decoding, trying to work out what these things mean, if they are sort of far right, if they're conspiracy theory, if they're racist, if whatever. Some of them are not. Some of them are maybe quite innocent, like this one. I think I love family, I love family. Donna. Uh, Donna Mark. Then there's all these Ks in. I don't know if that was kind of clan or something. So it does say clan there, you see. So it's just um, here he has all these strange things, that like uh, football results, but also Revelations 13.6, which is one about um, the end of the world, I think. And then all these other things, these dates. One of those dates is to do with an attack in Northern Ireland, um, a kind of a massacre in Northern Ireland. But it could be his birthday, for all I know. So it's sort of decoding all of this sort of stuff as well. This sort of kind of, it's kind of very deep conspiracy theory uh, material that's come to Britain from America. I mean, now, of course, it comes online, but it's here now. All these, these, these things, there's all these weird conspiracies. There's a whole thing now about law, about what's natural law and real law. I don't even understand it. I actually don't understand it when they explain it to you. This is um, Deus Volt. That's that guy with the tattoos. It's, uh, it was a crusader phrase. Got, got. So, so now the person you were planning on interviewing has pulled out. Yes. What's the plan for this work? Well, that's a really good question. The person I was going to plan on interview, I think I can say who it was. I think it's okay to say. It's for an exhibition in Graz in Austria, and I was going to interview John le Carre, the writer, mm. who's very vocal about Brexit, but also started his career as an agent in Graz, or as a sort of intelligence officer in Graz. But he had been talking to him for months about this, and he's actually pulled out. And I wanted to sort of talk to him about this imagery and mm -hmm. what's happened to Britain and the rise of fascism, the relationship to Russia, all these things. So I have to make the film by myself now. But I'm really worried, actually, that I'm going to make it... Working with this material, this imagery, you end up making it look kind of cool and glamorous and whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, just because it's quite strong and you look at these things. and I just, I just don't want to make it look good, even though it's very strong visually, it's very powerful. Mm, yeah. So it's, it, I'm sort of struggling a bit. Mm. Yeah. And I have interviewed people as well, some of, some of these people, not a lot of them, because they don't talk to you. Well, they don't, they're not very happy to talk to you. Because mm. <laughs> some, some of it was going to be with the BBC and they just would not go anywhere near the BBC. They hate the BBC. So. Anyway, it's a conundrum. So I just, just thought I'd show you something. This is a, this is a, a band from Glasgow, one of these sort of, um, marching bands, sort of orange men bands. That came, two came down to London, were going round and round uh, Parliament Square. Mm. It's unbelievable, really, to see that in central and London. What's your, what, do, what are you doing when you're there? Are you merely taking, I say merely, taking photos, or are you, are you trying to engage the people in Parliament Square? Not that day, because mm. I didn't have a camera that could do that. I had a little mm. camera. I didn't want to go with a big camera, because I just didn't want to be too conspicuous. So I had a small, what looks like a stills camera, but it has very good quality, and I was just, I was just observing. I was looking at things like this, looking at what the insignia people had, the strange flags, these weird flags about Britain. I spoke to one person, but I had done some interviews before with people, but uh, you don't necessarily get that much out of them. Once you start, after about a minute or two, you, it, things start, you know, reality sort of, sort of falls away often, mm. and you don't really know what they're saying. So with some of them, not all of them, but some of them. But actually, going through the rushes is one of the most depressing things. About, uh, yeah, it's just awful, yeah. like looking at all this, because it's yeah. very, uh, it's all about shouting and volume and using music and sound to drown out people. And it's, it's very stressful watching it. It really yeah. is. I think it's really interesting what you said about the, you don't want to glamorize it. No. I think that, you know, that's an obligation, isn't it? You can't. No, you can't. But if you sort of start isolating these insignia and then, do, in, and then doing things with them, or anything, it starts making it look, I mean, cool, I use yeah. the word cool, I mean, it's yeah. like a bad word, but it, you know, it makes it look something that mm. you don't want it to be. You don't want it to, uh, I don't, I, I'm struggling here, but uh, as you can tell, I'm struggling with the whole thing, mm. but uh, it's, you know, it's important. But maybe in mm. 10 years time, it, you could get something out of it, but at the moment, mm. maybe it's too close. We're yeah. just too close to this. We just don't know what it is. I think it's really, a really interesting point, actually. Maybe sometimes you do have to wait for the work. Yeah, well, with all grief, I had to definitely, going back to the beginning of, that's a very good point, actually, we're going back to this, 
There's no way it could have been done ten, even 10 years after. Mm. This was done 16 years after. Because people, the anger levels were so high. Yeah, it's just too raw. Yeah, and the police would have said no, and the reenactors would have said no, because it was just un, it's super unresolved. And it still is, really, isn't it, as a story? I mean, in a way, Brexit is the, is, is, uh, is the greatest or worst legacy of the strike, mm -hmm. you could argue, um, or one of the worst. So. Could, I have well, to go. Yeah. I have to go <laughs> we, to a jury we meeting have to at go, twelve. Yeah. So that was that was the sound. You got the last. Okay. I take oh, one right. question. Yeah. We'll we take this one last question. Yeah. I'm so right, thank sorry. you. That's all right. Um, my question is just around um, paying participants. Yes. I recently took a theatre show around, and we worked with uh, local brass bands. And at mm. first of all, um, they, they were volunteer volunteering, and that was really great. But then it, it just occurred to me that it's really important to pay people it because is. it's their first paid gig and it means yes. a hell of a lot. And so mm. I just wanted to ask you... Did we? Did you pay people in general or, yeah, is it voluntary based? Um, we paid the reenactors, the miners, former miners, and all reenactors. We didn't pay the people doing the First World War piece uh, because it was felt by the people in the theatres that actually this was, you know, you don't get paid for, for doing... Uh, sort of amateur theatre productions or for like training things and so on and uh, so they felt that was fine um, but you know wherever possible you should and the brass band gets paid obviously um, but yes here we paid you know I'd say between a third and half the budget went on paying the extras as they were called but, but um, the participants but yeah you should, they should be um, where where you can and where, you, where it sees fit. Okay. I'm afraid I can't take any more questions because Jeremy really does have to run. I just, would you join me in thanking him? Thank please? you. Thank you, Jeremy.